Okay, picking up where we left off uh, Thursday. <clears throat> this is Andrew Marvell's To His Coin Mistress on page 648 in the 11th edition. Um, outline 31, 2, 33, I think. <clears throat> it's the beginning of the third stanza. So, the first stanza was all about if we are all the world and all the time, uh, the world and all the time in eternity, we could talk about what we love for as long as forever. Second stanza is, but we don't have that time. Uh, death is pursuing us. And once we die, you can uh, forever hold on to your virginity, so to speak, except for the worms that will kind of crawl in and out of you. Third stanza goes not from this imagined all the time in the world and not to the future, but to the very present. Now, therefore, while the youthful hue sits on thy skin like morning dew, and while thy, while thy willing soul transpires at every pore with instant fires, now let us sport us while we may, and now like amorous birds of prey, rather at once our time devour than languish in his slow check power. So a couple of things there, several things. Youthful hue sits on thy skin like morning dew. Um, what happens to dew in the morning? You know what? You see it if you get to work, you wake up early, you see it on the grass in the morning, and what happens as the day goes on? It evaporates, it disappears. He's saying, the speaker is saying, the man is saying to his beloved, his girlfriend, the beauty that you have now, the youthful hue, hue refers to the appearance of her face, the appearance of her entire body, in fact. He says, it does what? It sits on you like dew does on grass in the morning. As your day, your life progresses, it's going to evaporate. What was once young and beautiful and desirable will be old and ugly and repulsive. And while thy willing soul transpires at every pore with instant fires, he's suggesting, not so subtly, what about her? He's suggesting that he thinks something about her that he believes to be true. And this is a, I don't know that I'd be sexist enough to say that this applies only to men, but I'd kind of say it probably applies more so to men than to women. He's saying, you want me. You want me. Your soul, he says, is breathing through your pores, giving out this desire for me. So he says, now let us sport us while we may. So now therefore, now because you want me, because you're young and beautiful, because you're hot, you know, the, the fires, let us sport us while we may. That is, let's have fun. And he uses an image or a metaphor of um, how does he call it? Amorous birds of prey. Raptors, eagles, falcons, hawks, kites, etc. He says, let's mate like birds of prey do. What? Well, it was thought in the Middle Ages and Renaissance that the way, for example, eagle, eagles mated was they would fly up to a high distance, 10,000 feet, 5,000 feet, something like that, and the male would mount the female and then they would stop flying. And start dropping. So the female, who's obviously closer to the ground than the male, not by much, but still, you know, it's like, hurry, 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 as they're getting closer and closer. That's why he says, like amorous birds of prey, let us at once our time devour. Why? Because that's one of those instances of, like, you see your time running out quickly. Let's devour, let's eat up all that time. Rather than, what? Languish in his slow, chapped 
power. Slow chapter. Gloss tells you slow jawed. Chapter actually refers to the lips. Eating. Time slowly does what? You guys are all in your 20s. I'm in my 60s. When I was your age, I was able to do a hell of a lot more than I can do now. Well, even five years ago, I could do a lot more than I can do now. Time slowly does what? It chips away at you. Look at the Smoky Mountains compared with the Rocky Mountains or the Sierra Nevada. The Smokies are the oldest mountain range in North America. Rockies and Sierra Nevada, if I remember right, are about the same age. They're tall. They're very pointed. Okay? Rocky, the Smokies are rolling compared to those. He's saying, let's, let's make our time work for us. Let us roll all our strength and all our sweetness up into one ball. Let so entwine ourselves, okay? That's the one ball. And tear our pleasures with rough strife through the iron gates of life. Uh, the criticism I've read on this poem indicates no one really knows what the hell he's talking about with the iron gates of life. I think, could be wrong, the game was invented by the time he wrote this in 1648, 1681, by the time it's published. I think that might be an allusion to the old lawn game, croquet. If you've ever played croquet, you've got a mallet on a long handle, wooden balls, and what do you try to do? You try to knock this ball through the wicket. Iron gates of life. And you win by knocking it through all the wickets with, I think it is, a least number of strokes, and hitting this stake at the end. That's the only thing I can think of that makes sense, okay? Why? Thus. Now, now, thus. That is conclusion. Though we can't make our sun stand still, that's a biblical allusion that's alluding to Joshua and the forces of the Israelites at the town of Ai in the book of Joshua, and God makes the sun stand still so that they have enough time with daylight to defeat the enemies in the enemy in the city of Ai. We can't make our sun stand still. That is, we can't get so physically active as if to stop time, he says, but man, we will make him run. We're going to, like, burn out time, so to speak. Okay? <clears throat> um... Before we go on, a couple other, um, I said we, we would do some of these terms later, so we're going to do them today. We talked about, um, on the reading for April 1st, talked about all those, many of those terms and such, but today I want to go on briefly, hold on just one second. Yeah, we will. On 7.30, I need to actually look at this quickly see if I do want to talk much about sounds. Uh, you got ballads referred to on 731. You need to know what those are. On 734, 735, and 736, you have rhyme. 734 is 735. The terms in bold, again, you need to know. The two most important ones that I'm going to uh, emphasize, alliteration and assonance. Alliteration. Repetition of the same consonant sounds, okay? And you've got examples given in some of the poems that come up later, and we'll talk about some of the alliteration in poems that we see. <coughs> Excuse me. Assonance, repetition of the same vowel sound in nearby words, like same, came, that A, okay? Plus they also rhyme. Rhyme, next page, you know, everybody knows what rhyme is. 7, 38, 39, you've got different kinds of rhyme um, discussed. Know what they are, that is, be able to know the difference between an in rhyme, internal rhyme, um, bottom of 739, all these different terms for rhyme that's close but not perfect, near rhyme, off rhyme, slant rhyme, approximate rhyme, etc. Okay? Um, I 
anything else in there. 754 to 74, you have patterns of rhythm, okay? 754, 55, um, the terms rhythm, stress, meter, prosody, accent, you need to know all those. 756, 757, uh, the top, okay? You don't need to know about iambic pentameter necessary, blank verse. You don't need to know all these other terms for different kinds of what are, what's called meter. Um, Sessura on 758, there are three different terms, four different terms. You need, do need to know those. And yeah, poetic forms, we'll talk just as we go on to them. So back to looking at specific individual poems. Um, line, page 645. Hopeful, nope, we've already done that one. Author tour book, 692. This is Anne Bradstreet. Okay. This is, the poem is an example of a controlling metaphor. You've got metaphors alluded to on pages 690, 691. <coughs> Excuse me. Figures of speech. Metaphor, like we talked about the other day. It's a comparison without using a comparing word, like like or as. Okay? So, you know, um, he's a pig. That's a metaphor. He eats like a pig. That's a simile. The author to her book by Anne Bradstreet. Anne Bradstreet is the first American poet. All right? Notice she's a woman. The story kind of behind this poem, <coughs> I've got something in my throat that I can't get out, is she wrote a manuscript of poems. So collection of pieces of paper that she had these poems written on. I think it was her brother-in-law took the manuscript without her permission, took the manuscript, went back to England, published it, had her name as author, Anne Bradstreet, and brought a printed copy back. That prompts, so to speak, this poem. Okay? And the reason it prompts this poem is she gets the book and she's ashamed by it. At least if we can take this poem as indicative of her uh, thoughts. Okay? She's ashamed by it because she doesn't think the poems are finished. They're not perfected. I don't mean finished like she stops in the middle of a line. I mean finished, she revises them to perfection and such. Well, she takes the book and takes the poems that are in them and revises them, edits them, perfects them, arranges them in particular order and such. Then she publishes that here in the United States. Right? The book is called The Tenth Muse. The book of her poetry is called The Tenth Muse. <coughs> All right. So she lives in Massachusetts, mid uh, 17th century, 1612 to 1672. Notice she's only 60 when she dies. And pretty much everything she writes about are the kinds of things you would expect a housewife in the mid 17th century to be involved with on a daily basis. Family, home, children, husband, cooking, cleaning, managing the house. Animals, not pets, chickens and that kind of stuff, okay? Um, the house burned down at one point and she writes poems about the burning of the house and building the new house, etc. So, 1678. Notice this is published after her death. Thou ill-formed offspring of my feeble brain, who after birth didst by my side remain, till snatched from thence by friends less wise than true, who thee abroad exposed to public view. So what's the ill-formed offspring? Now that you know what the metaphor is, those are the individual poems, okay? Of her feeble brain, that is, 
Ah, shucks, I'm just a nobody. Who after the birth, that is, after she wrote them, they remained by her side. Why? She hadn't shared them with anybody. She hadn't published them. And she also, by using this construction, who after birth did by my side remain, she's saying that these are like the after birth. After a woman delivers a child, you have the baby, and then she has to deliver the placenta afterwards. Okay? She's saying that these are like the placenta, the part you don't use or want. Till snatched from thence by friends less wise than true, that is, the one who took the poems was being true in the sense of loyal. That person thought, these are great. More people should read these. But wasn't wise because they weren't ready, she is suggesting, for public consumption. Who they had brought exposed to public view, that is, had them published. Now, you have to understand, publishing in this day, well, a couple things. And this will make some of the other lines uh, more clearly understandable. Paper in Bradstreet's day was not made out of wood pulp, like this is. It was made either out of either cotton rag or linen. And you get this cotton, you put it into a big vat, a lot of water, and you just boil it. You boil it till the strands break apart, and you just get this mush, okay? You spread that out over a rack, you press it down, and you have cotton paper. Right. Um, so you take that paper, you put it on a printing press, and say you want to print something. Well, you have to have the material you're going to actually, the matter you're going to print. That matter would have been given to a printer in handwritten form. You know, we've talked about it here with Hamlet, solid versus sullied. And I explained how, because based on the handwriting, this could be misread as this. There wasn't standardized spelling in Shakespeare's day, for example. So you're the printer, you've got this material, you don't quite understand it, you take your best guess. She's going to refer to that in just a moment. So, made the in rags halting to the press. Halting means they're not perfect. The poems aren't, aren't complete. They're crippled. Where errors were not lessened, all may judge. That's this idea. The handwritten manuscript isn't perfectly legible to the printer, and the printer introduces mistakes. Errors are made. Um, I'm, I can't read a book if I find an error, and I do, in everything I read. I'll circle it. Actually, I got a book several years ago from a publisher, Broadview Press, and it just had numerous errors. And I immediately typed up an email to the editor, sent it off, and they did a second edition just like four or five years later. This was something like on poetic forms, and they were talking about Old English poetry. And I sent them several corrections. They thanked me in the acknowledgments for the second, okay? It's how my mind works. I see those kinds of errors all the time. So, made in rags halting to the press to trudge, where errors were not lessened, all may judge. At thy return, that is, when she got the published copy from England, my blushing was not small. Understatement. She blushed greatly. Why? My rambling brat in print should mother call, because it says the title in Bread Street. She's embarrassed by these. I cast thee by the published book as one unfit for light. Thy visage was so irksome in my sight, it bothered her. Yet being mine own, at length affection would thy blemishes amend, if so I could. But because they were hers, she thought maybe I can fix them. Maybe I can correct them. Hmm. So how are you going to do that? How do you fix a problem when you've written a paper for a class? Shoot. And it's do, and you don't have time to get to a computer or printer. Where I used to tell students, um, I still do, 
when they've got a paper due, if you find a correction, you're sitting there waiting for class to begin and you're kind of blind, and you find an error, hand write it in. Better you find it and acknowledge it than I find it, implying that you completely didn't see it. So she says, I thought I could fix these. How? Not by taking the book and handwriting them in there, but by taking those poems and rewriting them, correcting them. So how's she going to do that? I washed thy face, but more defects I saw, and rubbing off a spot still made a flaw. How many of you, taking a you know, Scantron exam or something, black it in the wrong circle, and you've got to unblack it and do something else? Well, you've got to make sure you get all of that shadow out. Otherwise, it's still going to regard that as an error. And you erase, and you rip it. And I can't tell you the number of times. I've done something like that. But in her day, it's not a matter of writing something in pencil, because there weren't pencils. There were only ink pens. Not ballpoint, but the kind you dip in. How do you get that ink off a page? You can't erase. You gotta take a knife and scrape. Rub it off. Rag paper tears easily. That's what she's talking about in terms of rubbing a spot and still made a flaw. I stretch thy joints to make thee even feet. She's talking there about the meter of poems. Okay, I, I'm, I said um, just a moment ago, iambic pentameter, that you didn't need to know what that is. Well, iambic pentameter, pentameter means there's 10 feet. Feet are stressed, rhymed, unrhymed syllables. So a foot is a rhymed and an unrhymed syllable, or unrhymed and rhymed syllable, okay? Five of those together, stressed, unstressed, so two, five of those together make 10. So there's 10 syllables in a line of iambic pentameter. So she says, I stretch thy feet to make the, I stretch thy joints to make the even feet. She's implying that some of her poems, she only had nine syllables. How do you make a line 10 syllables if you only have nine, you add a single syllable word to the and for is but etc. Yet still thou runs more hobbling than is meet, than is appropriate. In other words, I couldn't fix them all. She couldn't think of maybe she needed a two syllable word. Couldn't think of it. In better dress to trim thee was my mind. Better dress. That's referring to clothing. Well, what's the clothing of a poem? It's the words, the diction, how it appears. But not save homespun cloth in the house, I find. Homespun cloth. This is polyester, okay? This is not something you can make at home. It's made out of, you know, petroleum, essentially. Homespun cloth is the cloth that you've the source material is cotton, okay, or wool, the wool that you get from a sheep, okay? You card that wool, that is, you pull the wool off the sheep, you get the impurities out of it, you spin the wool to make thread, all right? And from that thread, you weave cloth. She's talking about the kinds of material she had are just what she found in her home children, the home, belongings. She wanted to write better poems, she suggested. She wanted to write about greater things, but the only material, so to speak, she had to write about was what? If you're a budding writer, you'll be told one thing above all else, write what you know about hard to write about something you don't know anything about. So you have to research, etc. In this array, amongst vulgars, mayst thou roam. That is, in the homespun material, daily life of a housewife in America in the mid-1600s, mid she says, you can go among, vulgars means just common, ordinary people, other people like herself, but don't. 
Don't get into the hands of literary critics. In critics' hands, beware thou dost not come. Why? Because literary critics, she's implying, are going to castigate the poems for not being about the great ideas, truth, beauty, justice, loyalty, friendship, love, you know, etc. And take thy way where thou, where yet thou art not known. That is, okay, she's writing in Massachusetts. I hope you get sold in Rhode Island. I hope you get sold in New Hampshire. I hope you get sold in New York or Pennsylvania. Why? Where people don't know me. If for thy father asked, that is, what was your inspiration? Say, thou hadst none. That's an illusion. Okay, so she says, the only stuff I know to write about are common, ordinary things. That is an illusion, the classical myth. That is, in Bread Street was educated. She wasn't a dummy. That's an illusion to the myth of Venus being born from the head of Zeus. For thy mother, that is the one who gave birth to you, she's poor. So if you're asked about your mother, why are you here, child? Say, she's poor, which caused her thus to send thee out of door. Why, hundred years and more ago, and today in many places of the world, not so much in America, why did parents send their children out at young ages to work? Get them out of the house because they hated them? Maybe. To help support the family. She's saying, I'm poor. That's why she takes the book out of hiding, out of the dark, revises the poems, sends them off to publication so that she can make some income from them. Okay? Go from there to John Dunn, Valediction Forbidding Morning, page 704. A um, couple comments about Dunn. Dunn was regarded, his contemporary of Shakespeare partly, um, died fairly young, 28 and 31, it's only 59. Um, for his early life, he spent time as a soldier. Uh, he was a member of parliament briefly. And in 1598, he went to work for Lord Thomas Edgerton, whose position was the keeper of the seal. The seal is this big round metal object that the queen uh, used to, today we would say like notarize a document. It was the, key, the queen's imprimatur, her, her indication that this document has been seen and approved by her, like decrees and things like that, okay? Edgerton was the one who kept that seal. So when she needed it, he would be the one to bring it to her. Not just a mere kid. I mean, this was a high, powerful position in the land. Dunn became his secretary. He handled all of his correspondence, writing letters to and from famous and important people. Dunn was 26 at the time. About the same time, Edgerton's niece came to live with him. She was 14. Dunn fell in love with her. He was 26, she was 14. Okay? They get married three years later, secretly. When they marry, about three months after they get married, her father finds out, okay? hits the fan. He's a sir in his own right. His name is Sir George Moore. He immediately has done fired. Edgerton, you know, when he finds out what this guy who works for him has done, he immediately fires him. His new father-in-law has him thrown in prison for about three months. Um, when he gets out, he cannot find a job for the life of him. And so he starts writing even more than he was before poems. And these poems are written for specific people. They're written for them, either they're named to that individual or someone employs him to write a poem about the death of a family member kind of a thing, all right? Now, this poem, 
could be based upon the time of when they were married, but it wasn't publicly known. All right? And that's why the speaker is telling the woman that is being addressed, don't mourn, don't cry when I go, when I leave to travel. Because if she cries, if she mourns, she'll let the cat out of the bag, so to speak. According to Dunn's first biographer, however, a guy named Isaac Walton, the poem is written about a specific instance, long after they're married, where Dunn is supposed to travel to the continent, to Europe, with his employer, a man named Robert Drury, another important, powerful person, and his wife, whose name is Anne, tells him not to go. She's had a premonition, like a dream. And the premonition is, while you are traveling, the baby that she is carrying will be born dead. And her implication is, don't go and the baby will be born alive. Okay? Dunn did go on this trip in 1610-1611. So he's gone for over a year. And she did deliver a stillborn child. We, I mean, that's fact. We know that. Walton says this poem was written because of that. Okay? So, it's a valediction forbidding mourning. What's a valediction? When you graduated from high school, assuming you went to your ceremony, you had to listen to, or maybe you were the one who delivered it, a valedictory address. The valedictorian would give a little speech. Literally, valediction means a goodbye saying. Diction, saying. Vale is goodbye. Okay? So it's saying goodbye. This one is saying goodbye, forbidding mourning. Dunn wrote three valedictions. Valediction forbidding mourning, a valediction forbidding weeping, and a valediction, I can't remember the third one, something like, you know, my name in the glass, where he carves, inscribes his name on a window. All right? So, this poem is filled with imagery. It's a very imagistic, sound imagery, visual imagery, etc. As virtuous men pass mildly away and whisper to their souls to go, while some of their said friends do say, the breath goes now and some say no. So that whole first stanza and the second stanza are a simile. As the first part of the comparison, the next stanza, so the second part of the comparison. So the first part, what is being compared? Virtuous men dying. Okay. How do virtuous men die? The speaker kind of tells us. When they die, they whisper to their souls to go. That is, they die silently. There's, it's not like the minister's black veil, where the you know, minister of Westbury tries to lift the veil and he goes, no, you know, I look around me and I see it's, is he dead? And sometimes if you're at a deathbed, my mother-in-law, when she passed last year, we were all in the room with her and it's like, is she gone? Because sometimes the heart is beating so slowly, you can't see the rise. And often what happens, especially in plays, is someone gets a mirror holds a mirror up to the mouth or nose. And if there's a slight fogging, you know they're still alive. Okay? So, as virtuous men pass mildly away and whisper to their souls to go, some of the friends sitting around the deathbed are saying, is he alive? So let us melt. That is, let you and I part from each other like the soul parts from the body. And make no noise, no tear floods, nor sigh tempests move. Tear floods and sigh tempests are Petrarchan images. These are named after an Italian poet named Petrarch, the guy who invents the sonnet form. We'll talk about sonnets in a moment. And he invents all of these images of lovesick lovers. Okay, 
So you're in love with a beautiful woman and she doesn't pay any attention to you. And so you sigh and you mourn and your sighs get so exaggerated, hyperbole, that they create hurricanes and windstorms, okay? Your tears become so overflowing, they become floods that destroy crops and such. So he says, let us melt like these dead guys. Let's not make any noises. Let's not make any floods. To a profanation of our joys to tell the laity our love, or love, right? Because love and move rhymed in Shakespeare's, in um, Dunn's day. So what does that mean, profanation of our joys to tell the laity of our love? Well, laity is a religious term. If this were a church, and I'm up here speaking at you, what would that make me for all intents and purposes? I'm the preacher. I'm the minister. You are the laity. You're not ordained, to use the theological language, to speak, to run the service, so to speak. Okay? So he says it would be a profanation of our joys to tell the laity our love. He's saying our love is something holy and religious. It's something we are ordained to, just the two of us. And if we told others, the laity, about our love, what would it do? It would profane them. So what does it mean to make something profane? It means to desacralize it. It means to desecrate. To take something that's holy and make it unholy. Okay? Another image. Third stanza. Moving of the earth brings harms and fears. Men reckon what it did and meant. But trepidation of the spheres, though greater far, is innocent. Moving of the earth. That's what? Just had one in New York last week. Scared the bejeebies out of a bunch of people. You had some idiot congresswoman saying, climate change. Climate change has nothing to do with earthquakes. Utterly amazing. Earthquakes, okay? I'm from California. Grew up with earthquakes. Five, 6.0 earthquakes, not that odd. If a 6.0 earthquake hit this area right now, these chairs would be bouncing all around and you guys would start doing this and you'd probably start feeling sick to your stomach. That's usually the main thing that you feel, okay? But he says, but trepidation of the spheres, though greater far, is innocent. So here's the earth. Trepidation of the spheres refers to the Ptolemaic idea comes from a Greek astronomer, so to speak, named Ptolemy, okay? Which said that the Earth is at the center of the universe. And around the Earth is a series of nine spheres, each one larger than the other. And they all move. They all move because out here in what's called the Empyrean, God dwells. And according to Aristotle, God is the prima mobile, the prime mover, first mover, all right? God makes this one move. So this is the ninth sphere. It's moving this direction. The movement of this one causes this one to move all the way down to us. What is this the basis of that we still see around today? You could pick up a newspaper and find this in every newspaper. Horoscope, astrology, the movement of the planets and the stars. The reason it's not horoscope and astrology worked was because what you tried to do was to determine which of the planets and stars influence you were most born under or that were most powerful at the time that you were born. So all these things moving have an impact on earth it was thought. But Dunn says, trepidation of the spheres, that is movement of the spheres, though greater far, is innocent. The speaker is saying, assume for the moment these things exist. 
the movement of those is much greater than some little earthquake down here on Earth. Right? I mean, you're talking vast distances. So how can the movement of those be innocent compared to these things rocking and rolling? Because in 1610, Galileo proved that the theories of Tycho Brahe, Johannes Kepler, and Copernicus, Nicholas Copernicus, I can't, Tycho, Brahe, Johannes Kepler, and Copernicus, Nicholas Copernicus, that their theories were all correct. Their theories, Kepler built on Brahe, Copernicus built on Kepler, their theories were that the Earth wasn't the center of the universe. Rather, the Sun, Earth, Moon, etc., all revolve around the Sun. It's called the heliocentric idea or, or conception of the universe. This is an indication, probably, that the poem is written after Galileo published his findings. And his findings proved Copernicus was correct. Okay? By the way, it's that finding that Galileo did, based upon his creating the first telescope, that caused him to fall afoul of the Roman Catholic Church. The church forced him to recant, and he did. He said, oops, I was wrong. And he went under house arrest for the rest of his life. It was only, I think it was about 100 years later, I'm not positive about that, that the Catholic Church said we were wrong <laughs> for doing what we did to Galileo. So, trepidation of the fears of greater forest innocent. Dull sublunary lovers love whose soul is sense cannot admit absence because it doth remove those things which element in it. So, Here's the earth, here's the moon, so let me do it this way. Here's the earth, here's the moon. Everything from the orbit of the moon to the earth is sublunary. It's beneath the moon. So, he says, playing on these ideas, the Ptolemaic system, everything beneath the orbit of the moon is impermanent or mutable changes, right? Everything in life changes. Today's not yesterday. Tomorrow won't be like today. There will be similarities, but nothing stays the same. Dull sublunary lovers love. So their love is governed by what? Change. Impermanence. Whose soul is sense. What does he mean by soul? The root cause behind the love of these kinds of lovers is sense, that is, sensory perception. So what's it based on? We're all men. I'm assuming you're all straight. Her beauty, her body, her voice, her person, all those, it's all those physical things about her, okay? Dull sublunary lovers love whose soul is sense cannot admit absence. Because what is absence? It's the lack of all those physical things. And absence does what? It doth remove those things which elemented it. Elemented makes it up. So if you're a dull sublunary lover and your beloved walks out the door and you can no longer see her, the speaker is suggesting what happens? Out of sight, out of mind. Out of sight, out of heart. Why? Because the things that create your love, her body, are gone. But we. The but implies what? We're not this kind of lover. We're not sublunary lovers, but we by a love so much refined that ourselves know not what it is. Our love isn't confined to this orbit. 
All right? Love, according to classical thought, Aristotelian philosophy, Platonic philosophy, etc., Christian philosophy later, love always, if it's real love, always points to something else. That is, it's never about me. It's always about something, someone else. And ultimately, it always points to the sumum bonum, the highest good, which is God. Even according to Aristotle, love draws upwards higher and higher and higher. Okay? So, we by love so much refined that ourselves know not what it is, inter-assured of the mind. What does that mean to be inter-assured of the mind? Inter, like interstate commerce. That's from one state to another state. It's between. Between the mind, we're what? We're assured. What does that mean? I know she loves me. She knows I love her. Therefore, we care less eyes lips and hands to miss because the love exists where it's up here it's not in these it's not in these it's not in these it's not in this and it's not in the mouth it's in the mind so if she leaves or he leaves what our two souls therefore which are one Though I must go, endure not yet a breach, but an expansion, like gold to airy thinness be. How are their two souls one? Marriage. And the two become one. Okay? So he says, our two souls are one. If I go, they don't endure a breach. That is, there's not a ripping apart. What happens? He says, they are like gold. To airy thinness be. What kind of metal is gold? Anybody know the term you use for it? Lead is the same, by the way. Not steel. Steel is brittle and hard. Gold and lead are both malleable. You can pound them, you can bend them. You can't, it's hard to break gold or lead. Literally, you could take gold and pound it thin enough to replace that glass in those windows and see through it. It would be gold-tinged, but you could still see through it. You could do the same thing with lead. So why does he allude to gold and not lead? Because lead is plenteous. It can be found all over. Gold is not. It's rare. So he says, our souls are like gold to airy thinness beat. If they be two, meaning, okay, maybe she's... Really, get out of here. Like she's thrown up a roadblock. Okay, so let's say our souls are two things. They are two, as stiff twin compasses are two. And by stiff twin compasses, he means like a compass you use to draw circles. And the stiff twin compass, he means the two legs. So a compass closed looks like this. I meant to bring one in. I always forget. I've been doing this over 30 years, and I don't think I've ever brought one in. They're like this. So what happens if you want this point to inscribe an arc on a piece of paper? What must you do? See, this won't work. You gotta lean this one. And the farther this one goes away, what? The more the fixed leg bends after it. Done loves this image. He uses it an awful lot. Our two souls, therefore, excuse me, if they be two, they are two so as if twin compasses are two. Thy soul, the fixed foot, hers is the point that goes into the paper, makes no show to move, but doth if the other do. And though it, her soul, in the center sit, yet when the other far doth roam, it leakens, it leans, excuse me, and hearkens after it. Hearken literally means calls. 
but it doesn't have, it just bends towards it. In other words, it looks towards it. And grows erect as the other comes home. He's done a couple of different things there. What are the stiff twin compasses? They're being compared to what? Their souls, which are being compared to what? Their love for each other. This is what's called a metaphysical, metaphysical conceit. Okay? Term was invented long after done. And what it refers to is this linking together, this analogizing to wildly dissimilar things. See, when you make an analogy, you're too, usually comparing two kind of similar things. A metaphysical conceit is you take two things that are as far apart as you can think of. This example, a drawing compass with their love. Another poem by Dunn, I don't remember if it's in your book or not, called The Flea, like a flea parasite, compares their speaker and a beloved's love to a flea. He compares a marriage bed to a flea. How? What does a flea do when it bites you? What's it, get, what's it trying to get? Or a tick. The better image is a tick. He doesn't use the word tick, but the image he does in the poem is more like a tick. When a tick latches on you, what's it getting? Blood. What does it do the longer it's on you? It gets fatter and fatter and fatter. So what if a tick bites you, jumps off of you, and bites your girlfriend? So it sucks some of your blood, sucks some of its blood, her blood. Now your bloods are mingled in that flea. What's that an image of? Sex. Bodily fluid mixing. That's disgusting, right? It's a metaphysical conceit. He's drawing together two wildly dissimilar things. Love with a parasite. So back to here. So... Your soul sits in the center of the circle. What is the circle? His travels. Okay. As long as she stays here, he says, no matter how far away I go, I'm connected. What? What's the difference if I were to have a compass that I could use even? What's the difference between the kind of circle I would draw there and that? That ain't a circle, not a perfect circle. A compass would make a perfect circle. That is, no matter where this was from the point, it would always be the same distance. Because when it's not a circle, what happens? You go out of orbit. <laughs> and once you leave that orbit, you just keep going. So. Such will thou be to me. You, he says, will be my fixed point. What's the fixed point in the northern hemisphere for a mariner? You're out on the ocean. What do you navigate by? Anybody know? North Star. North Star. And you'll hear the phrase, what is your North Star? That means your reference point. The thing that you can point to and always be able to figure out, if you have a sextant, where you are on the globe. Such wilt thou be to me, who must, like the other foot, obliquely run. Obliquely, at an angle. Thy firmness, you staying here, makes my circle just. Just means perfect. So what's going to happen... If she stays where she is, he says, I'm going to lean after you, or, or I'm going to use this. You know, the two points are like this. This one goes away. This one harkens after it. And when it comes all the way back, then what? Closes back up, and I will come right back to where I am. Thy firmness makes my circle just. It makes me end where I begun. His point is, if you come with me, because there's some, uh, if I remember right, one of the things Walton says is that she wanted to go with him. 
And he's like, no, you got to stay here, okay? If you stay here, you will draw me back, all right? Go from there to, I don't think we're going to be able to finish this, but we'll see. Um, 660, Ode on a Grecian Urn. So that's a classic example of a metaphysical poem based on a metaphysical conceit. This is this first one, John Keats, Ode on a Grecian Urn. And then we're going to do Ode to the West Wind a little bit later. Odes are one of the genres of poetry you need to know. And, and by the way, all those bold-faced terms, I think I mentioned this like the first day of class, all the bold-faced terms, there's a glossary in the back. It gives them all, okay? So Ode. An Ode is a longish poem, serious topic, uses elevated language, okay, um, that's usually dealing with main primary issues of life and why are we here and such. So this one's on a Grecian urn. I've been to the British Museum many times and that the implication is the speaker is talking about a specific urn. They have a whole collection. In fact, not all of them are out for public viewing. They've got hundreds that are kept hidden away, essentially. And I would swear, I've looked on the British Museum website, I don't think I found it, that I've seen the urn he's talking about. There are these Greek urns, they're, they're black, okay? They're shaped, you know, kind of like this, okay? Not, obviously they're better than that. And they have sections to them. They're basically black, and then like here and down here, they will have alabaster inlaid around them. Alabaster's white. And what the inlay is doing is it's showing us these images. And the images are like a picture. They're picture that portray or that give off an idea that you could then put into words. Thou still unravished bride of quietness, thou foster child of silence and slow time, sylvan historian, who canst thus express a flowery tale more sweetly than our rhyme. That is, this image can portray a story better, he says, than this poem. You've heard the phrase, a picture's worth a thousand words. What leaf-fringed legend haunts about thy shape? That is, at the top, probably, and at the bottom. Of deities, or mortals, or of both. In Tempe, or the dales of Arcady. What men or gods are these? What maidens loathe? What mad pursuit? What struggle to escape? What pipes and timbrels? What wild ecstasy? Okay, so we've just been given short snippets of descriptions of what is portrayed on this vase or vase, okay? There are human bodies that may be human, they may be gods. There are leaves, there are women who we're told are loath, that is, they don't want something, and we're gonna see as the rest of the poem goes, through the depictions, someone is chasing after this young maiden, the mad pursuit. Heard melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. Well, what unheard melodies? That's referring back to this again. See, when these spheres move, they rub against each other. And what happens when you rub things together? They make a sound. When these move and make sound, they make the most beautiful music. And it's thought that the music of the spheres, if you heard it here on earth with your human ears, you would immediately die. It is so beautiful, it would rapture your soul. 
It would take your soul out of your body. That's what he's alluding to. Okay? Heard melodies are sweet, the kinds we hear with our ears. Those unheard are even sweeter. Therefore ye soft pipes play on. That is, somebody on this urn is playing a pipe. Set of pan pipes. They look like this. Each one of these is a tube. Longer the tube, higher the sound, I think. Okay? They have a little reed in them, and you move it back and forth along your mouth like a harmonica almost. All right? So somebody's blowing on one of these pipes in the vase. Obviously, there's no music with it. But the fact that the person's lips are to it means what? Within the world of this, there is music. We don't hear it. Not to the sensual ear, but more endeared, pun on words, ear endeared, pipe to the spirit, that is to the soul, ditties of no tone. Whatever the image of the piper is here, playing a tune that you don't hear with these ears. You hear the tune with your heart, with your soul. Fair youth beneath the trees, notice another image. Thou canst not leave thy song, nor ever can those trees be bare. So the trees are loaded with leaves. Bold lover, never, never canst thou kiss. Though winning near the goal, yet do not grieve. She cannot fade, though thy husk not thy bliss. Forever wilt thou love, and she be fair. That's not the person playing the pipe. The person playing the pipe is sitting next to a tree under a tree loaded with leaves. Then we get an image of a lover and a woman being pursued. And we're told the lover will what? He'll never kiss the woman being pursued. Why? Because they're frozen in this image. But just because he'll never kiss her doesn't mean he will forever grieve, yet do not grieve. Why? She's not going to be like the coy mistress in Marvel's poem. Because she's not going to rot and die in a grave. She will forever be fair, desirable, beautiful, and what? Just outside his reach. Forever wilt thou love. Notice, he's pursuing her. He will never experience, being frozen like that, what? Grief. He's always in that moment of passion and never not having it. Ah, oh, happy, happy boughs. The trees that cannot shed your leaves nor ever bid the spring adieu. The boughs will never experience what? What's the shedding of the leaves metaphor of? Death. And happy, happy melodist, the piper. Unwearied, forever piping songs, forever new. More happy love. Happy, happy love. Forever warm and still to be enjoyed. Still means both constantly and always. And it also means what? Not fully yet to be enjoyed. Like if you could somehow yell, yell, action, and have the figures on the vase start to move, he would achieve his love. Nope. Forever warm and still to be enjoyed, forever panting and forever young, panting, out of breath, tired, desirous, all breathing human passion far above. That is, these things are above real human passion that leaves a heart I sorrowful and cloyed. Real human passion, what happens? 
You experience those highs, and then you experience the lows. A burning forehead, headache, and a parching tongue. Why parched? Thirsty. Thirsty for what? For the, for the, for the fulfillment of the love. And parched, never being fulfilled. Who are the another image? Like there's another section. Who are these coming to the sacrifice? What sacrifice? We're going to be told. To what green altar, O mysterious priest, leads thou that heifer lowing at the skies? So the heifer, the cow, is looking up at the skies and all her silken flanks with garlands dressed. The cow is covered with flowers. Notice, what's going to happen to the cow if they were made active? What little town by river or seashore or mountain built with peaceful citadel is emptied of this folk this pious morn? And I'm thinking there's also a painting, not at the British Museum, at the National Gallery, where in this painting, there's a guy playing pipes sitting, standing actually like this, next to a tree. And a little ways before him is a young man chasing a young woman. Her gown is flowing behind her. In another part of the painting, there is a cow being led, a bunch of people following, the cow's covered with garlands, and off in the background of the landscape, you see this little town. It's almost like that's what he's describing, because the people have left the town to attend to the sacrifice of this cow. We don't know why. And not a soul to tell why thou art desolate, the town is desolate. Why the people have left? Can air return? All the people offer the sacrifice, they will never return. Why? Because the image is frozen in time again. So, O Attic shape, that refers to a shape of Athens, not portraying Athens, but something produced by Athenian Greece. Fair attitude with breed of marble, that is design, of marble men and maidens overwrought with forest branches and the trodden weed, thou silent form, why? Because everything he said is the spirit of the observer hearing this, interpreting this. Thou silent form dost tease us out of thought as doth eternity. The speaker is saying, I look at you, what's it do? Looking at this vase makes the speaker think of all these ideas. And it teases us out of thought. In other words, you reach a point where thought stops. Just like eternity, if you really stop to think about eternity, you have to stop because you can't. What does eternity literally mean? outside of time. Try to think of anything outside of time. We can't. Why not? Because this is the only experience we have. Cold pastoral. Pastoral? All the images in here are what? They're rustic. They're of people outside the town, in the country, in the grove. But it's cold. Why? Notice it's not hot. It's not passionate. It's cold because it only leads to thought. It doesn't lead to real love. It doesn't lead, lead to anger. It doesn't lead to passion. When old age shall this generation waste, this generation, speakers talking about his generation. It's published in 1819. He's talking about in 1819. When old age shall this generation waste. So 1829, 1839, 1849, when that generation is dead and gone, what? Thou shalt remain in midst of other woe than ours. That is, this vase well, outlive me. Look at the date. 1819. Keats died two years later. 
He died at 26. He had TB. He probably, take that back, he knew he was dying already. He knew for like the last five years, if I remember correctly, that he was dying. Okay? Um, when old age shall this generation waste, thou shalt remain in midst of other woe than ours. So 1819, what other woe? Go up 100 years. World War I. The Boer War, England and South Africa in the late 19th century. You will remain a friend to man to whom thou sayest. So this thing will be speaking, so to speak, still to humanity and saying, famous quote, one of the most famous quotes of all English literature, beauty is truth, truth, beauty. That is all ye know on earth and all ye need to know. This is what the vase will be saying. Beauty is truth. Truth is beauty. What the hell does he mean? People have been answering that question for 200 years. What is meant by beauty is truth? Okay. Go from there to... I thought we were doing order on the west wind. Nope, I got that later. Acquainted with the night, page 711. I think we can do this in 10 or 11 minutes. Robert Frost, preeminent poet of the United States, the first half of the 20th century. Poet laureate. Um, read a poem at JFK's inauguration in 1960, or at 61. Okay. Many of his poems have to do with the natural world, a lot of natural symbolism. This one, Acquainted with the Night. Okay. One of the things about this poem, it's loaded with symbols. That's why it's on the section symbol of allegory and such. Some of the symbols. The night, the moon, raining, walking. Okay. I have been one acquainted with the night. Notice the tense, I have been one, or I have been acquainted. Notice, it's not I was acquainted, because that would be past tense. It's not I had been acquainted, because that would mean it stopped in the past, came up, and stopped in the present. I have been one acquainted means this began in the past and is continuing to right now. What's called present perfect. Okay. <clears throat> I have been one acquainted with the night. Short, simple, declarative sentence ends. I have walked out in rain. Dash means pause. And back in rain. I have out walked the furthest city light. Now we don't know how big the city is, but the speaker is saying, I used to go for walks, or I go for long walks at night. I've gone out in the rain, and I've come back while it's still raining. I've walked to the beyond the last street light of the city. I've looked down the saddest city lane. I've passed by the watchman on his beat and dropped my eyes, unwilling to explain. Notice the run-on sentence. It doesn't end with beat. It, you keep reading. I have passed by the watchman on his beat and dropped my eyes, unwilling to explain. The watchman, the cop, when they used to walk a beat, and says, I dropped my eyes, meaning I didn't look him in the eye. I tried to avert my gaze. For what purpose? I don't want to talk. I don't want to be questioned. Unwilling to explain. To explain what? I don't want to get into racist stuff, but you two would have more of a problem than I would in certain parts of Middle Tennessee. I could walk around in Bell Mead any time of the day. A black man, mm, not as easily. Okay? The speaker is saying what? It's not about race here. 
It's about the time. Cops still today, even with white men, if you're walking around somewhere and it's 3 a.m., they're going to think, what are you doing? I don't want to explain. I have stood still and stopped the sound of feet when far away an interrupted cry came over houses from another street. Pause. But not to call me back or say goodbye. Notice the long pause breaking stanzas. Why did the feet stop? They were his feet. Stopped walking. Why? Because I heard a cry. An interrupted cry from houses, over houses from another street. Pause. We don't know what the cry is until we get the last line of that at the beginning of the next stanza. But not to call me back or say goodbye. The speaker stops because he hears a voice and he's thinking, come back. Return. But that's not what the speaker hears. What's the implication? If I heard that come back, I would turn around. But I don't. So I keep going. And further still, at an unearthly height, one luminary clock against the sky proclaimed the time was neither wrong nor right. What's the luminary clock against the sky? He gives it away with the word luminary, the moon. But what does the moon proclaim? The time is neither wrong nor right. Time for what? I have been one acquainted with the night. So what does it mean to be acquainted with the night? Why might you go out walking long periods of time at night? Not wanting to be seen, not wanting to be heard, not wanting to talk. See, everyone's going to answer that a little bit differently. The answer's got to be predicated on the words that are actually here, though. He walks out when it's raining, that is, leaves the house in the rain. And it's still raining when it comes back. And it's not like he walks out two steps, oh, it's raining, and then goes back. No, no, no. He goes out and walks beyond the city street light and comes back in the rain. Why would you do that? <clears throat> A little preoccupied? Something going on? You're trying to work something out? Why? What are you trying to work out? What do the rest of the stanzas say? I stopped. The sound of feet, because I heard a cry, but it's not saying come back. The hell with you. F you. Is it that? Or is it, Johnny, come back. We love you. Why might somebody, some have read, I, I read it this way entirely. This is someone who's wrestling with depression. This is someone who's just got to get out, got to, and wrestles with the demons that way. But if the speaker had heard, come back. Or, notice, goodbye. What does goodbye mean? Goodbye doesn't mean go away. Goodbye is not final. Goodbye implies there's still a relationship. Come back definitely implies that. The speaker hmm, really struggling. There's one image that could give an indication of what the speaker is possibly struggling with. And it's the image of the moon. What is the moon? often symbolic of. What word do we get from the Latin word for moon? Lunacy, lunatic, come from luna. 
That is, you are one who is governed by the moon. Well, what do lunatics do? What do crazy people do? I, I'm not casting, literally, I'm not casting aspersions on anybody. My uncle committed suicide. They contemplate suicide. Why is suicide, quote unquote, crazy? It violates a basic premise of being alive, which is to preserve one's life. It's one of the ways we know something is alive, especially something sentient. You put something dangerous to it, and it will back away. Even flowers put heat, and the plant will literally move. Okay. Is this speaker contemplating suicide? I kind of think so. Okay. Um, two minutes. Do we have time for the next one? No, we do not. We'll pick up with my last Duchess on Tuesday of next week. I don't know how. Still going to try to get all of these done. Um, even if we don't discuss them all, they will all show up on uh, the final exam at least. Because, I mean, largely they're going to show up as name the author to the poem. Might give the poem, name the author, that kind of thing. All right. Have a good weekend.